So Enrique, just give us like a brief uh, historical context of where we're at today and like some of the work that you did uh, back when back when you were the assistant director. Okay, well, well hey, by the way, thanks for uh, putting this together. Uh, <laughs> I had reservations because of what was going on all over the place, all around us right now. But anyway, yeah, uh, my... Uh, my, I guess the way I look at it is that uh, we, <clears throat> my role here started from at the very beginning, really ultimately trying to lay the groundwork for what, yeah, for the, for the final establishment of the major. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I came to UCLA in 1990, maybe 1989. And uh, uh, at that time, the center itself was in transition. So that, uh, yeah, and it had no permanent director then. But a year after I got there, Dan Nakanishi, after his uh, battle for tenure uh, at UCLA, also got appointed as the permanent director of the center. So <clears throat> that, that's, uh, and well, uh, <laughs> As soon as we got together, he appointed me. Uh, one of the things he wanted me to do was to take charge of the academic program. I, I guess uh, he figured of all the people at the, in, the, in the center staff at that time, uh, I was the only one with a PhD, so to speak. So I could deal with the egos of uh, those PhDs who would be, you know, the faculty. Uh, affiliated with the uh, with the center, so uh, that position was really to put me in charge of the academic programs. This program had that was the MA program in Asian American Studies, the only one of its kind then. And uh, at the undergraduate level, uh, there were certain courses uh, about Asian Americans, but nothing really very much organized. Although. Uh, <clears throat> You know, there were a, one of the most notable courses that the, off, the center was offering and managing were Asian American experience classes. Uh, <clears throat> for example, Philippine American experience, which was taught by Uncle Roy uh, Morales. Uh, those of you who um, can go back, Japanese American experience, which was uh, uh, taught by uh, another researcher at the center, Yuji Chioka and uh, perhaps a class in Asian American literature, Asian American psychology, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, Dan Mogwili, who was with the East West Center, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, taught a class on Asian American theater. So those are some of the things uh, I remember from this period. Uh, <clears throat> one of my, you know, one of my, my, uh, one of my charges was obviously to build the uh, curriculum of Asian American studies, MA as well as undergraduate. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, one, of my, uh, one of my goals for, uh, was to move this assortment of undergraduate courses towards a major, a major in Asian American studies. And, uh, <clears throat> but there was also a personal goal that I had uh, being Filipino American, you know, which was to lay the groundwork also for a possible minor or concentration in Asian American studies. Now, <clears throat> uh, at that time, this was uh, basically shortly before the 1992 LA up riots and uprising on the Red uh, Rodney King, you know, issue. So, <clears throat> which we, you know, kind of, it's kind of interesting that we found ourselves today again in the middle of another social upheaval. Uh, in any case, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that, that, that pipe dream, what the, that thing about Asian American, uh, no, no, Asian, I'm sorry, Filipino American studies, oh, was really a pipe dream for the most part at that time. Uh, because it was hard to imagine, you know, how, how you would do it, how one would do it in an academic setting. 
there were several there were several preconditions for this thing a Filipino American studies to happen. Uh, <clears throat> first was that I thought that it should happen in the context of an a Asian American studies, a BA in Asian American studies. So if you could situate, you know, not only if you're gonna situate a minor concentration, where would you stick it, right? History, you know, anthropology, literature, where would you, uh, where would you situate that and of course the ideal thing and the one i was in fully control of was an asian american studies uh, degree program or ba in asian american studies uh, <clears throat> so that it would much be much easier to put it there okay at that time uh i don't know how you guys how far you guys go but uh there was no major okay this was uh, we had an ma in asian american studies but there was no major in Asian Uh <clears throat> There was definitely no department. And so to get to that point, to, in other words, to secure a base, a stable base for the minor in Filipino American studies, one had to first go through a major in Asian American studies, and then finally a department of Asian American studies, you know, and then, of course, uh, it's one thing to have an administrative framework. One has to have faculty to teach them. So it's all of those conditions. Uh, you know, uh, strong Asian American studies run by department, tenured faculty to teach those courses regularly were really the major objectives here, the work that I needed to do. Uh, <clears throat> as for Filipino American studies, uh, I felt it was crucial to develop and cultivate uh, interest among students. So, uh, when so that when courses would be offered about Filipino Americans, uh, the classes would be full. I mean, you had to demonstrate to uh, administration that that there was interest, you know, in Filipino American studies courses. Okay. <clears throat> And this was the role that, that Filipino American experience, the one course about Filipino Americans that we had, you know, at the time, that was the role of that class. And uh, I mean, you know, it was a basic Filipino American, Filipino American studies 101, so to speak. That was my, that was how we envisioned the class. But I was very lucky because Uncle Roy, you know, was the lecturer for that class. And so uh, <clears throat> he was actually, you know, he was actually the perfect, the perfect instructor. He was from the community. He was not a hard hardcore academic. He was from the community, uh, but uh, could put together. I mean, he, after all, he had, uh, Uncle Roy had an MA somewhere in, I think even in social work, I'm not sure. He had an MA, so he had the academic, you know, wherewithal to put together a reader, and then uh, <clears throat> not just put together the reader about Filipino Americans, but also uh, to enrich, you know, his, his reader with his own experiences from the community. So that that uh, <clears throat> I mean, as it uh, as it turned out. Uncle Roy's class was a massive hit. When I first we when I first got there, we had a class of about between 20, 25 students. But as we continued to offer it year in and year out, the, the uh, enrollment started to increase from 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know. At some point when when uh he had 80 students enrolled okay i had to put a cut i said hey man come on <laughs> first of all i had no money to pay for teaching assistants 80 students it that was i don't know how he managed it he was smiling and laughing all the time and you know and students were following him all over the place but basically 
uh, I think he, he, we were also lucky because, and I, I should mention this, because one of these uh, staff members at UCLA who used to work someplace in the College of Engineering came forward to help him. His name is Felipe Lamog. <clears throat> and Felipe Lamog and Uncle Ru were basically a, cop, a, a team from that point on, you know, helping manage that. And, and then, uh, <clears throat> What was happening probably behind my back was that this Uncle Roy and, and Felipe <coughs> were, were uh, recruiting students who had already taken the class to help administer. I mean, you know, listen, if you had 80 students, well, how are you going to call the role? And you had probably a one hour or even a one and a half hour class. By the time you're done calling the role on 80 students, uh, you you've wasted half an hour already of of class of the class period. So that so, but they did it, and then uh, think about grading, correcting papers, all of that stuff. So anyway, so, so Philippe Bilamo, Enrique, yeah, um, we are uh, pressed for time, so we do have one more minute. So any any last words oh, okay. or, or comments? Well, okay, so that's basically what was going on. In any case, you know, Uncle Roy's class was really very successful. And so based on that success of that class, number one, we were able to do a lot more. We were able to offer a class in Filipino literature and English. We were able to, I was able to offer a seminar on U.S.-Philippine relations. Uh, we even started a Tagalog class. So uh that you know that was based on all of these things oh by the way the guy the guy who who offered who we invited to offer a class on filipino american literature in english was none other than uh the philippine national artist uh nbm gonzalez so that you know we were able to get some fairly strong people to come and help uh, and so, oh, and then we were able to do a uh, a conference on Filipino American studies. So all of those demonstrated to the university administration that there was a viable core of knowledge, you know, to do a lot more courses in Asian American studies. And uh, I mean, I think this is where Bong. Uh, you know, and his uh, uh, cohorts of uh, suspects started to come in because at that point they started to have a conversation on how about if we have a minor? But of course, at that point already, we, were, we, we already had a uh, major in Asian American studies and what was needed was to establish a department so that then Bong, uh, they would not be up my you know, uh, picketing in front of my office, but instead we go picket the Asian American Studies Department <laughs> to ask for a minor. And basically, what I did, what what I did in that in that regard was the, basically, Bong came in. We helped identify course possible courses to be included in the minor. <clears throat> and, and ultimately, <clears throat> you know, that was how that con that conversation in Asian American Studies. Uh, and, and Filipino American study got started. At that point, I was I was also moving on to become department chair of CSUN, Asian American Studies. So <clears throat> it was left to Bong and his co-conspirators to figure <laughs> out <laughs> how, how to get uh, to the, you know, if ever. And, and at this point, the, the wheels to establish a department of Asian American Studies were already gone we already moving, and I, I'm just surprised that it didn't get really established until 19, uh, 2004 or something. But with that, with that, I mean, now you had a target. You had a department to pressure students and staff, or, you know, everybody else who, who, want, who was part of that uh, uh, campaign now had a specific target, which was the Department of Asian American Studies. So anyway, that that's my take on uh, you know, that's my take on how this uh, minor or concentration on 
Philippine American Studies got started. <clears throat> so, thank you so much, Enrique, for 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 giving us that history. Uh, I know you and I we talked a little bit about that uh, earlier this week, so it's really great to hear this and to capture this um, so that future generations of student leaders uh, can know about it. And we'll be hearing from Bong later today too, uh, one of those co-conspirators that you were talking about that was able to uh, push this along. So um, thank you again, Enrique. Everyone give like a virtual applause for Enrique for um, All right. the time. Glad uh, to, be, to be able to lay something out here. To <laughs> of course, no, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, uh, uh, a learning experience without you. So I appreciate you for being here. Um, so next we'll quickly go uh, to Melanie de la Cruz uh, Viesca. She's actually the current uh, assistant director for the Asian American Studies Center. Um, and she'll speak a little bit to what the value is of having this Filipino studies minor. Uh, well, thank you to PAA and George for inviting me to be part of this important discussion and celebration. Uh, I am coming more from the 2000s perspective. Uh, but I do want to thank Enrique for his insights because, you know, it's always good for me to also know the history of uh, Filipino uh, studies and our community at UCLA. And so, um, you know, I'd be remiss also if I didn't acknowledge the graduate and undergraduate students that were affiliated with um, like Asian American studies and like especially the Committee for Filipino Studies in the 90s that were part of that campaign for Asian Pacific languages and culture. Um, I know Bong was part of that and several other of you on this um, webinar. So I know you all probably touch about that. Uh, but I do want to note that it, it really is building on these notable structural changes. Uh, once, you know, the campaign was successful in getting funds to get a lecture for Tagalog classes, the Vietnamese classes transferred from Youth Lake Session to Asian Languages and Cultures Department, uh, the establishment of Southeast Asian Studies Center, uh, to a lot of things like the third, like the Filipino studies conferences that happened in the 90s, uh, to, uh, as Enrique mentioned, that we um, established, uh, so the Asian American Studies Interdepartmental Program used to be under the center for 20 something years before we established the department in 2004. And that's when we were actually first able to hire our uh, first Filipino professor, Filipino studies professor Lucy Burns in 2004, and Professor Victor Bastgara joined the department in 2007. We'd had other faculty in other departments across campus, but again, as Enrique mentioned, having an Asian American studies department um, really allowed for more resources to support things like a Filipino studies minor. And so through students, uh, we, we were able and, and staff and faculty working together uh, as you mentioned earlier the concentration the Filipino studies undergraduate undergraduate concentration was established in spring 2009 so shout out to the student activists who did you know, who advocate for that that are on this um, event right now um, and now we've come to this major point where now we have a minor and that's really exciting uh, I think you know it's providing a space for students that are invested in Filipino history and culture uh, it's building that pipeline of scholar activists who's gonna who are gonna go into like different fields of education, arts, policy, government, nonprofits, and um, it provides that space to have critical discussions such as you know like the one that y'all are gonna host later on anti-blackness within our communities, right? And I think especially me, I've been um, at the center. I've been working from the center um, since two thousand two. And so what I've seen over the last um, 18 some years is that uh, third, fourth generation Japanese American students have really gone on to create and run these amazing community institutions, um, such as like the Japanese American National Museum, um, a lot of nonprofits in Little Tokyo. And so this is made possible because of the classes and internships at UCLA that have supported a lot of the Japanese American communities. And so what I think, you know, the minor really represents is, um, for Filipino students, which are still largely second generation, is that it helps us to build our knowledge base, resources for our community to get to that kind of level that the JA community has, you know, achieved in terms of sustaining Little Tokyo and, and JANUM and a lot of these nonprofits. And so I think the Filipino studies minor is gonna be a major step in that direction of building more resources and knowledge and so much more for our community. So um, I'll just end there. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Melanie, for giving us that perspective. I really appreciate the work um, that you all are doing. And you definitely get the, uh, oh, she's gone. No, she's, she's there. So, um, but you'll, we'll definitely, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, we'll definitely, uh, you'll have a partner with the Filipino Alumni Association um, to sustain it. Um, so quickly, we're going to be uh, introducing uh, one of our panelists uh, so she can talk a little bit about the minor itself, um, since um, there's been some questions about the minor. Um, so Christine Jan Espinosa is, um, uh, was a student affairs officer and academic advisor for the majors, masters, and minors in graduate concentration at the UCLA Asian American Studies Department from 2016 to 2019. Um, she was part of the tail end of the Filipino studies campaign, especially working in the administrative trenches, as she says, with uh, Professor Lucy Burns, um, who I believe is with us as well. Um, and now she's currently a, doctor, a doctoral student uh, in the PhD in higher education program at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and is also a research assistant for a NSF Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Hispanic Serving Institution grant. That was a mouthful, uh, but amazing work, Christine. So I'm gonna pull up the, um, the slides um, that she is going to talk about briefly. And um, we can also share these slides with you all as well, um, if you like to. Um, there's some information here that I believe Melanie uh, hit on, but wanted to go to, um, was it this slide? Christine, or was it the next one? This one. So, hi everyone. Um, I am honored to be part of this, and thank you, George and PAA, for um, putting this together. You'll hear a little bit more from me later, but these are just more about the nuts and bolts of what the minor looks like, in case you were wondering. So just about the minor itself, uh, the minor consists of seven courses, and it's broken into three parts. So two lower division courses, two upper division, and three upper division electives. And then the next slide. So if you wanted to take a look at what those lower division courses are, just at a glance. So one of them will be taken from Asian American studies. And then um, most of what you see is uh, really offered in the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. So next slide. And then this is just a glance of the upper division courses that are required. Uh, and again, same thing, the one of the upper division courses will be required from the Asian American Studies Department. And then the next or the second course uh, is going to be taken from the second list. And to complement what Enrique said, uh, shared earlier, now in Asian American Studies for upper division, uh, these Asian M courses, there's now a cap of 60 students. Next slide. Uh, and then finally, these are the electives. So students cannot really replicate these if they've already um, taken it for the other two upper division courses, but certainly this is the list that exists. So thank you. Thank you, Christine, for that quick uh, overview of the minor. It, uh, it looks like a really good list of classes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to like uh, leave this here for a bit for people to read because I thought it was uh, pretty powerful. Um, you know, education, Filipino studies is an education to respond to the state of the world and imagine otherwise uh, as current and future members of the global workforce, UCLA students need an education that equips them to respond to the state of the world. This culturally and socially focused program builds awareness and competency of UCLA students. Um, and I just want to pause here to, again, say uh, many thanks to uh, Lucy, Professor Lucy Burns, who provided these slides for us and to Meg Thornton. Um, and um, give me a second, I'm forgetting the first name, Meg Thornton and uh, Professor Allison Tintianco Kubales for providing these amazing pictures of, of history. Um, so thank you again, Christine, for providing that. Um, I will stop sharing and we'll go into the meat of today's uh, discussion. And we're gonna be introducing the panelists and the moderator uh, for this 40-minute-ish uh, discussion on, you know, their involvement with the campaign, uh, what it means to them, and what it might look like to look uh, to move forward. Um, so I will do a, a round of introductions. Um, it'll be quick and brief, y'all. Um, so bear with me. I wanted to introduce first uh, 
Arbong Vergara. Um, he was a director of committee uh, for of the Committee of for Filipino Studies from ninety two to ninety five. He had a BA in an Asian M in 1997 and has a joint MSW MA in 2001 from UCLA. And he taught Tagalog and Asian M at UCLA and social welfare at USC. He's currently a research consultant for Ventura County Healthcare Agency on social determinants of health and is a professor at a private university. And he runs a startup called uh, Young Moon that's working on how to harness technology in addressing food, energy, water, health, and sanitation issues. Up next, we have Michael De Vera, um, pronouns he and his, um, graduated from UCLA in 2009 with a BA in anthropology and with a minor in education and Asian American studies. Uh, he, went to, uh, he graduated from Seattle University with an MA in student development administration. Uh, he was the campaign manager of the Campaign for Filipino Studies from 2008 and 2009, uh, was part of the movement to successfully establish the Filipino Studies concentration in April 2009. Big Whoop um, has a student affairs and academic affairs background and is currently the associate director for graduate advising and student services at Northeastern University in San Francisco. Welcome, Michael. Um, we already mentioned Christine, um, who was the student affairs officer and academic advisor at Asian M um, Studies Department um, from 2016 and 2019. Um, Next up for one of our panelists, we'll have, we have Natalie Noodle Makoboro. She recently graduated from UCLA in 2018 with a BA in Human Biology, Society and Genetics, and a BA in Asian American Studies. So you can do both North and South Campus. Um, and with a minor, uh, with, a, with, a, with a concentration, of course. Um, she was the Samahan Filipino president from 2016 to 2018, heavily collaborated with Christine, Christine on connecting the student advocacy to administrative structures. Um, was joined in um, through other um, leaders at the time, Angelique and Kevin Casasola. Uh, she's currently Assistant Programs Coordinator for Associated Students at San Diego State University. Um, she's an incoming graduate student and in SDSU's Post-Secondary Educational Leadership and Student Affairs Master's Program and is involved with the Philam Organization Postgrad, also known as UNIPRO. Am I correct with that, Noodle? Awesome, cool. Uh, so those are our panelists. Welcome all panelists. And I would like to give a special welcome to our moderator for the panel, um, Dr. Emily Bautista, um, pronouns she and her and hers. She was raised in Carson, California, and has resided on the Solon and Occupy Tongva land in Los Angeles for her entire life. Um, she pursued a Southeast Asian Studies minor in addition to her Education Studies minor and psychology major in 2009 from UCLA. So she graduated in 2009 um, and she was, moved, she was fully immersed in student organizing with Samahan Filipino, being Samahan Filipino president from 2008 to 2009. Uh, she completed her master's in education in 2011 from UCLA, uh, served as a teacher and school leader for the past 10 years. Uh, she's continued to study transformative youth organizing as a decolonizing social movement framework and earned her education doctorate in 2018 from Loyola, Loyola Marymount University. She continues her political organizing work as one of the founding members of the People's Education Movement in Los Angeles and is currently bridging uh, these experience in consulting work for educators uh, committed to ethnic studies, philosophies, critical pedagogy, community organizing, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Let's give a warm virtual applause for all our panelists, for our moderators, rich history and rich uh experiences um so thank you all for coming here i'm gonna pass it all on to emily hi everyone it, it is so good to just hear all the stories that are already um coming forth i appreciate everyone being here um i can still remember the first time i heard the phrase no history no self no history no self which I believe popularized Jose Rizal's famous quote, he who does not know how to look back at where he came from will never get to his destination. This simple yet profound quote became my motto and my guide as I embarked on the journey of learning more about who I am in order to inform my life purpose after college through Filipino studies at UCLA. So just to kind of share with everyone who's here today our structure, I am, we are going to have two rounds where the 
where I'm going to be asking a series of questions. The, our wonderful panelists, I'm so excited to hear all their stories. Um, they're gonna be responding to the different uh, parts of the questions that resonate most with them. I will be taking notes as they, as they talk. And after the round is completed, I'm going to go ahead and make some connections between what the ideas that the panelists shared, and then we'll all transition into the next question. Uh, so, all right, first, our, for our first round, my questions are, what was your entry point into Filipino studies? What inspired you to embark on the journey to campaign for Filipino studies at UCLA? And at what moment in time did you join the campaign for Filipino studies and what made your context unique in this decades long struggle for Filipino studies at UCLA? So we'll go ahead and start with Fong. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Okay, I was uh, in 91 when I came in, I was uh, bio pre-med. So I wasn't a natural fit for curricular reform activism. I needed some external things to nudge me into activism. Um, and same is true for many of my friends who joined me. First and foremost, I, I want to acknowledge that before the call to action for Filipino studies in the 1990s, there, there first was a call for a call to action for Filipino studies in the early 1970s when Asian American studies was new at UCLA. So before there was CPS, their first was CFS, Committee for Filipino Studies. And I see Dennis uh, Garcia and Mark Polito in the room. They were, they were the leaders of CFS when um, many of us came in in 91. So um, bring you back to 1991. 1992 uh, by the Chicano Chicana Studies hunger strike. Does to remember Manong Larry Itliong and the UFW? Manong Philip Veracruz, key noting Philippine nation. passing shortly after. APA organizing for sweatshop workers. And finally, the threat to end support for elementary Tagalog. So all of these external events um, drove us to act in the early 1990s. Three years of organizing from 92 to 95 by Filipino and Asian American students and Asian American Studies Center faculty and staff ultimately saved Tagalog moving it from its experimental status to being part of the regular language. We also built consensus on what should make up Filipino studies. How should that look like? Um, and we, together with faculty and students, we envisioned that it would include American studies so that we could focus on the Filipino American experience. Um, area studies so that we could focus on the Filipino experience in the Philippines and diaspora studies so that we could focus on the experience of Filipinos around the globe, leading the activist, the advocacy of CPS then to include Southeast Asian studies minor. The biggest challenge was building support. So in 1994 or around there, 
we pushed for a coordinated campaign among the seven Filipino American student advocacy groups at UCLA to hold a Filipino Studies Summit over three days in Lake Arrowhead. Um, we, we, the seven student advocacy groups, along with uh, staff and the leadership of the Asian American Studies Center, specifically Enrique and Meg, um, we huddled together and, and we did the heavy work of aligning our programs and budgets to push for Filipino studies as one united front. The outcome of that summit was a coordinated plan for Filipino studies and the Save Tagalog campaign. In the fall of 94, we kicked things off with, a, with the first Filipino American History Month celebration, a hunger coalition carnival led by the late John DeLauro, an Atihan parade co-led by the late Don Mabalon, and a National Filipino Studies Conference at Kirkhoff Hall. The culminating event was a very political, sorry, a very political PCN in spring of 95, led by um, Jan Dilo, uh, Professor Chandler. Uh, she's, now, she's now known, I, I see her in the room too. That PCN tackled sexism, U.S. militarism in the Philippines and Filipino studies. So what began as a dream in the 70s is still uh, partially a reality with the Filipino studies minor of 2020. And because of how partial of a vict victory it is, um, I hope uh, coming together around this time when everyone is, is um, re-radicalized and animated, we could dream again and we could dream bigger and work toward the next milestone. Thank you. Okay, I guess, should I go? Can you all hear me? Just wanna make sure. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. And so as mentioned earlier, I was the, um, the education coordinator and um, the campaign uh, manager. I co-managed with Emily in 2008, 2009. We called the Campaign for Filipino Studies CPS, where we successfully lobbied with faculty to establish the Filipino Studies concentration in April 2009, which was mentioned before. Um, I was part of the academic committee, um, and it was the initial driving force behind C when CPS began. Um, so I'm going to talk about some challenges, and before I go into the challenges, I think it's important to know the context in which we were living in, because um, that itself was a challenge. Because at the national level, we were going through a recession uh, during a time when our first African-American president was elected. And that in turn influenced campus politics, because budget cuts were on the horizon. Students began organizing around the pledge referendum to help protect some of the very core services and programs that the community programs office uh, provides like space and spear. So as an org, SP had multiple large-scale campaigns to juggle. Oh, and not to mention, uh, two of our community members were running for USAC positions. Spoiler alert, uh, we won every single one of those campaigns, which I'm proud to say. And meanwhile, the, the community of faculty and staff um, that we needed support from were in the middle of a search to find the next director of the Asian American Studies Center, which is a huge deal, given the fact that Don Nakanishi held the seat for 20 years. So, in a nutshell, it was a time to be alive at UCLA. On top of that, there was a lot of internal, internal struggle we were dealing with as an org. We had financial issues, we had org identity issues, and as a board, we rarely agreed on anything. Meanwhile, we had to find ways to escalate what was originally a four person committee's desire for a concentration or a specialization um, into an organization's top priority and then convince every stakeholder that this was a priority. How did we do it? We spent time power mapping, brainstorming how every component of the org can push the campaign's agenda and also coming up with a slogan that would ignite some visibility. We called it PAVE, Filipinos for Accessibility, Visibility and Expansion. 
And that was just the summer because when it was time for fall, our approach was to use virtually every existing event and opportunity as a platform for PAVE. In October, for PAM, we had launched PAVE through an energetic general meeting. Abby, our cultural coordinator, uh, created a beautiful exhibit that illustrated the potential for Filipino studies inside Kirkoff. Um, during the study, Students of Color Conference, we held the Filipino Studies Caucus. So the Students of Color Conference that year was actually at UCLA. We uh, held the Filipino Studies Caucus uh, with reps from other schools to spread the word on our initiative. We hosted fundraiser socials. We utilized Filipino Youth Empowerment Day to plant the seeds with the youth to get them to believe that ethnic studies was important. We also had SPCN. And all of these things made a unified statement. And one of the main reasons we were able to accomplish so much was because we funneled much of the work into our committees, where we discovered people with unique strengths that also pushed the movement forward. So in short, there was a lot of internal controversy, but at the end of the day, we placed aside our differences and expressed an external unity. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is that no one ever tells you how to run a campaign, let alone how to begin one. And it's extremely important to acknowledge that it wasn't just me, nor did I begin the campaign, because when I joined the campaign in 2008, much of the groundwork had already been done. Joseph Felix was my predecessor um, and had done a bulk of the research because we didn't know that concentration was the answer at the time. Um, we, we, he was sort of the architect of the proposal and studied academia. Like how does one establish a minor? How does one establish a specialization? What are the differences between a specialization and concentration? Oh, and Joe's here. Um, hi, Joe all the way from France. Um, so while Joe was the mind, I felt like Emily was the heart. Um, she continuously reminded us, reminded us the why and kept us moving forward even when we hit bumps. She was always someone I leaned on because she had experience being in rooms where people make decisions. And other than that, it's kind of overwhelming to think about how many other entities were involved and what role they played. PAA shined a light on CPS, with Filipino Scholars Today, community-based organizations reviewed our proposal and declared their support. Staff from the Asian Am Center and department helped us understand the political landscape in academia. And key faculty uh, like Victor Basquera and Lucy gave us points to consider. So there's so much more that we could reflect on and what made that moment so important and the lessons learned. But I think I can take away is how we are literally building upon the work that those like Bong and Enrique and others did before us in order to be step in order to be a stepping stone for what Christine will go into. And I'll pick it up from there. So as far as what makes my context unique is what I consider the alignment of the stars or the cosmos or the universe, <laughs> whatever uh, helps uh, this case. So this is the chismes of 2016 to 2019. So first, the Asian American Studies Department was undergoing its eight year review. So that's a review of, of its management and operations. Second, the new department chair was Professor Victor Bascara. Third, Professor Lucy Burns was serving on the Faculty Executive Committee or the FEC that oversees academic programs. Fourth, Noodle was Samahang Filipino president and other SP leaders were Asian American studies students also. And then five, UCLA took a chance on hiring a non-UCLA alum to work in the department in February of that year. That's me. So a little bit about me though. Uh, so I'm South Bay born and bred. I grew up in Carson uh, and every summer since kindergarten, I was a part of Filipino cultural school when it was still under the San Paquito Women's Circle in Wilmington. I danced in PCN in high school, and in college I volunteered at an orphanage in Cebu. So I didn't even really bat an eye when I connected with student leaders like Noodle and UCLA staff, especially the legend, Meg Thornton, who caught me up to speed about the campaign of Filipino studies, the work they have done, and particularly the Filipino studies minor by the time I arrived in Westwood. So these Asian American studies majors who are also SP leaders taught me the advocacy history. And it gave us a little bit more open communication because literally after I was working on their degree audit, we would just proceed to talk about the minor. 
So to me, student leaders like Noodle and other SP leaders really didn't have to convince me of anything. So it was more like I wanted to know the administrative institutional history because I saw my entry and role into this campaign as how can I activate and take advantage of this student affairs role as a full-time staff member to help push this Filipino studies minor through already. So like I said, this is an alignment. So at this point, Professor Bascara, the new department chair, and Professor Burns were the two faculty members in the department regularly offering courses in Filipinx studies, as well as overseeing the SPCN student-led Asian Am 95 class. And then with Professor Lucy Burns in FEC, it gave her and us access to successful and unsuccessful minor proposals being reviewed. Literally, these are models that we just worked off of to set up the minor proposal. And then the eight year review, that was strategic in two ways. So first, behind closed doors, I explained to undergrads who were participating to verbalize their concerns and needs to the external reviewers who were evaluating the department, including talking about the informal and internally managed Filipino studies concentration at that point within the Asian American studies major. And in my interview with the external reviewers, I brought up how I inherited the oversight and management of the concentration and the need for institutionalization. So to be honest, I, in, all I inherited when I first started working in the department was the commencement booklets. And that was the only way I could figure out who were the Asian American, uh, sorry, the Filipino studies con concentrators. So I created an Excel sheet to document who pursued the concentration based on those booklets. And I manually went into some of your degree audits to document the classes each Filipino studies concentrator took. Uh, and then second, the importance of that eight-year review. Because it went on the record for the external reviewers, it became part of the official recommendation to UCLA senior level administration, particularly the Division of Undergraduate Education. And in turn, when the report came back, the report prepared by that division as a response to the external reviewers uh, underlined how the Division of Undergraduate Education would support the institutionalization of Filipino studies um, as a minor. So in addition to this lineage of advocacy, this report sort of became part of the rationale points to push the minor through even more. So, all right, we had to get into more work mode. So Professor Lucy Burns and I started and we had several meetings with faculty senate staff to even just get the language right to match those successful proposals. And the Asian American Studies Department work study students, bless their souls, I poured and I, we had to pour over the UCLA catalog to identify undergraduate classes that could work for the minor uh, that were outside the department. Uh, and it was a select number of faculty who taught undergraduate classes, even though there were Filipinx faculty everywhere, not everyone taught undergrad classes. And then for those classes, Professor Victor Bascara emailed each department chair where these courses were offered to even gain the approval to use it for the minor. And after several Microsoft Word document drafts emailed back and forth, we had a, dr a draft ready to be shared and Professor Burns sent individual emails to Filipinx faculty members at UCLA asking for support letters. And then I helped gather the Filipinx student org support letters. And with everything compiled, we proposed the minor to the Asian American Studies Department faculty, the official first part as far as, the, as, far as UCLA goes, um, as part of the minor proposal process. And we got the department to vote in favor. So it was only after my time uh, under Professor Burns, Professor Bascara, and under, under my SAO successor, Greg Poncho, who's also here, who saw the proposal move through to the upper echelons of the university, to the faculty committees, um, to like undergraduate council and FEC. So this is just some of the behind the scenes labor that went into that May 2020 approval. And I didn't even talk about the organizing of Mediendas to talk about the minor across campus. So that's where I'll end. Okay, I'm just gonna hop right in then. Thank you, Christine, panelists, everybody. It's wonderful to see y'all here. Emily, thank you for the question. Um, kind of sitting here listening to the history myself and I'm getting that same feeling that I did in undergrad when I heard the stories of the people who came before us and I'm just like, wow, I'm a part of this. Um, 
So for context, I was a student at UCLA from 2014 to 2018. Big notable thing that happened in the year that our CPS was going on was the transitioning from President Obama to President Trump. Um, there was a lot of unrest, I think, on campus in communities, marginalized communities, and amongst our own community. Um, and I really didn't know didn't know the best way to handle it, didn't know what way to approach it. But something that I think my journey with Filipino studies in general is that I kind of inherited it. I was set up in a, in a position to have access to a lot of history. And I really chalk it up to my parents for giving me those gifts and those bits of wisdom and nuggets of history. And I just didn't deeply appreciate it until I got to college. Um, like Bong, I entered UCLA in South Campus, thought I was gonna be a doctor. So I came in <laughs> biology, pre-med. And my first fall quarter, I said, gotta take a GE, what's Asian American Studies 20? With Professor Bascara. So his name is being brought up a lot because, you know, and it's wild how he's connected in all of our stories across generations. Cause that was the first time I ever learned about someone who looked like me. And so my entry point into Filipino studies was really my entry into Asian American studies. Um, as a first year, I ended up declaring it as my minor because I loved it so much. And I'm gonna name drop here. Christine De Los Santos uh, invited me to a, a Samong Filipino political committee meeting. And she asked me a lot of critical questions about what I learned in the class and it scared me. Um, it scared me, but it helped me realize that there's just so much about me and my people that I have to learn. So I came into Filipino studies through a lot of the student-led and student-run internship courses that were, of course, supported by our faculty. Space, Spear, and SPCN offered courses that entire first year, and I never had more fun doing school, never had more fun learning in history. Uh, moving into my second year, I was serving as activities coordinator for Salma Hong Filipinos Board, and that was really the first time I was exposed to leadership and what running a campaign looked like. I remember sitting there and the board was discussing campaign for Filipino studies. At the time, Kevin Casasola was our external vice president, and Angelique Taloyo is our education coordinator, proposed that campaign for Filipino studies should be the organization's focus for the year. Um, I wish that I could say the organization was similar to Mike and Emily's time, but we know that organizing has its ebbs and flows. And so when we introduced this concept to our community, I think a lot of us were confused. You know, like what is Filipino studies? Why do we need to make this our campaign? Why is all of our programming need to be centered around this kind of, this kind of work? Um, and we were being challenged by our fellow peers and I was, I was so green to this work. I, I really was just there to learn and observe. Um, but we continued. And I think one of the biggest and best things that Kevin did, and George is going to pull it up on his screen, is that Kevin led a data-driven survey. And we surveyed over 200 Filipino students on campus to um, see if they knew anything about Filipino studies. It was part as PVW, which is Philippine Visibility Week. And so these are kind of the raw results that we got. What campuses are you in? 34% North, 63 South, and four in the middle. And then you see there is a breakdown. A lot of, a lot of the students that we interviewed were in South Campus. Um, as we continue to move through the survey, at the bottom you'll see that, let me just wait for George, you know, we asked students if they had ever considered changing their major. Um, I think one of the biggest needs that we needed to address was that the conversation about Filipino studies wasn't happening. Um, this question was interesting because a lot of people did consider moving majors and the, the direction that they did consider, we were surprised to see the response about North Campus. Um, moving on. <laughs> Almost 50% of the students we surveyed were pre-med. And so having them go through and take this survey really brought up something in them. We had a lot of discussions afterward about what it did, how it made them feel, and why this was coming to them in college. And you know, I was, I was in that group of 50% of students who felt like this conversation needed to happen a long time ago. Um, and so we asked, finishing the survey, 
how many students would consider taking more Filipino studies courses? 64% uh, if more interested, 64% if they had interesting courses, 93% if they counted for requirements, and 1% of all students we interviewed were Asian American studies majors. Thank you, George. Um, so the numbers were, they were kind of shocking for us. We didn't, we didn't know that our community wasn't involved in Asian American studies, let alone Filipino studies. Um, and so I think a major victory of our campaign for Filipino studies was starting that conversation. Um, moving forward, we experienced leadership, burnout, and turnover. And so the campaign for Filipino studies was no longer an outward facing campaign, but a lot of my work in my upperclassmanship years was working with Christine, planning out my minor classes, and then talking about how we can move this forward to the point where she actually made it possible for me to double major in Asian American studies. Um, so yeah, my entry point into Filipino studies from the student side, I was somebody who really didn't appreciate the rich history that I had access to. And that was created for me. And when I entered that rich history again in college, uh, really opened my eyes. It was really the first time I was able to look at the world and, and look at myself and understand, you know, how important this was for people to be a part of it. And George, I think you wanted to uh, introduce somebody into the room. Oh, sure. Uh, this is George's voice. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Joseph Felix, who is uh, in France right now. And I wanted him to speak a bit since he was uh, the architect for the, uh, the concentration. So Joe, you can turn on your video if you want. Hey, everyone. I'm just, give me a moment. I uh, want to see if you can all hear me. Yeah, it says I can't start the video because the, the animator disactivated it. Is there a way to like <laughs> make it possible for me to activate my video or? Ah, uh, there we are. Ah, uh, uh, there we are, okay. Ah, uh, there we are, thanks. You're okay. welcome. Okay, so hope you can hear me all right. Um, yeah, greetings from Lyon in France. Yeah, it's uh, it's like four twelve in the morning here. So, <laughs> so pardon me if I look a little bit phased, but um, but yeah, it's like really great to like be with you all to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, this is like completely surreal right now. Um, so basically, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh well the groundwork that was laid during my time at UCLA so basically I was um, education coordinator with Samhung Filipino 2007-2008 uh, and basically the context was quite particular in the sense that um, basically within the organization we had been sort of noticing a, a general feeling of depoliticization, you know, within the Filipino American student population in the sense that the demographic of the Filipino American students that were getting admitted, um, it was fairly clear that they were coming from more, well, more socioeconomically, more privileged backgrounds. And so as a result of that, uh, you know, despite, you know, all the student activism that Samahang Filipino was involved in, was historically involved in, it's true, it was, it was a bit difficult trying to, you know, rally people around causes that we felt at the time that a lot of our peers, like, couldn't really quite connect with. And so part of the reason why we had ended up choosing CPS as, you know, the campaign like during my year on Samahong board was specifically because we really needed to find an issue that could be really directly relevant to students. And actually even before choosing CPS as the, as the topic uh, of this campaign, um, we actually did a lot of social investigation. So within the academic committee, so with um, Mike, uh, Emily, and then a lot of other names I can mention, uh, Joanne Denganen, um, Francis Borgona, 
and Emily Bautista. So basically, we uh, what we did is we we distributed a lot of surveys. Um, we discussed a lot in general meetings, and it was true that the general idea was that there was a lot of interest in um, Filipino studies, but quite simply that the word wasn't distributed or at the very least um, it wasn't like publicized as well as it could be or um, quite simply you know it didn't really have the visibility that you know would have been necessary to really have mobilized forth and so that's from there that the need for Filipino studies really you know came about and it became quite an issue the next big challenge was finding a way to you know mobilize around this issue and then try to get this sort of like quick win, because obviously we, you know, after a bit of research, we realized that having a Filipino studies minor was actually, you know, quite difficult to achieve because it required, you know, as um, as uh, Christine had mentioned, you know, talks with all these different entities, academic senate, faculty, executive committee, etc. So this is obviously something that we couldn't achieve in a year. Um, what we had eventually come up with was indeed this idea of a concentration within the American, Asian American studies uh, major, because it had the advantage of not having to go through all these administrative entities and um, just in general terms of resources, taking advantage of the resources in terms of classes and professors that already existed and trying to find a way to organize basically all of this that already existed into some sort of program. So this is something that uh, me and my committee, in general, all of Samahong Filipino that we worked on, that we publicized a lot during that year, uh, we crafted um, a proposal, basically, that detailed, um, you know, all the resources that existed, um, basically, you know, how relatively not difficult it would have been to organize this into a program, and then, you know, point by point, all the different questions that could have you know, been used to sort of oppose uh, oppose this movement. And so this is something that wasn't finished during my time, but which uh, um, Mike, which is my successor, had brought up. This is something that had continued, and I'm really glad to see that just a year later, he was able to actually, you know, he and, you know, obviously everyone, Emily and, you know, all the orgs were able to, you know, secure this concentration a year later. So I found, you know, that was really awesome. Um, you, you know, and I remember going on Facebook, like, you know, when I heard the news about this minor <laughs> and then like seeing that it happened and it's like really also real to me because it's incredible how you can like be involved in like a movement, like during your college days. And I was like a really, you know, big activist. This is like my big Filipino phase because I didn't really grow up Filipino. So this was like, you know, this is really my heyday to be a Filipino essentially. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, after that, well, I went to France to teach English. I ended up living there. I became French. And needless to say, it's like so surreal that this movement that you started when you were a student and that you sort of like never really forgot, but you know, it, you went on to do other things. Like that movement that you started would actually like be carried on by future generations and would actually produce something like 12 years later. I find that like so freaking awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, you know, I definitely think that really does speak to the power of being able to, you know, yeah, to really fight. And it really was something that I believed at the time, but I didn't really think, you know, I, you know, you, you believe in it, but you don't really see the, concrete aspect of it right away but it's true that i think that we all did believe that this is we were part of a movement we always talked about like you know being part of the struggles of the past and um, you know talking about the monos and then talking about all the previous efforts for cps etc and that we were inscribing ourselves in that movement and that movement would be carried on by future generations and i'm just like really extremely glad that like that actually happened, you know, like not that I was skeptical or anything, but it's just like so beautiful to see that all the future generations like kept up the struggle. And now that we've achieved something that's like really awesome, like symbolically speaking, it like gives us a lot of visibility. And I think that's exactly something that, you know, we as Filipinos, Americans, you know, we definitely need as a community in order to really, you know, anchor ourselves 
within the American scene and to really, you know, gain all the benefits that can be had in terms of like political advocacy and whatnot. So anyway, I didn't really prepare my speech. I'm just sort of like reacting, you know, just on the fly here. But um, basically all that to say that I'm just really happy to like see all of you. And um, yeah, definitely let's keep this movement going. Thanks. <laughs> Wow. Thank you. Thank sorry, you. Emily. Can I do a quick announcement? Yes. Um, yes. Again, thank you, Joe. I'm so sorry, Emily. Uh, we are uh, running late. Um, so we will be pushing the end of the time to 7.45, 7.50. So I do apologize. Uh, that's a little bit over the time that was stated, but I think these are great discussions and I don't want to stifle them with time limits as well. So um, keep going. Thank you, George. Thank you. Um, it has been incredible to hear everyone share their stories. Uh, just as I was as I was taking notes as as moderator, some of the things that really I started to think about was the importance of our representation in these spaces. And I, um, I, I'll never forget how the the internship at the community programs office really introduced me to the concept of the high potential program and learning how high potential program literally went to Carson where I'm from where there's a lot of Filipinos in LA how a lot of us were um, were recruited from high potential program to participate and to represent Filipinos and ultimately the those folks be, became the founders of Samhong Filipino and I think it's so important for programs like high potential program that are grounded in ethnic studies to to really center our community struggles and our movements and so i think from um what i was starting to hear just as i was um, listening to all the panelists was hearing like yeah a lot of us we've 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 adopted that narrative that we need to go to college and probably go in the medical field right <laughs> my mom was a nurse like she was she's like that's where the money is right and so that was definitely a narrative that happens and it was really powerful to see the numbers that noodles year was able to to um gather and uh it's it's interesting to to hear both bong and noodle talking about like yeah we were when we first came, came in we were just we were going to be south campus you know like we were we we're going with that you know with the path um but yet once they got into spaces that were made because of the because of this legacy grounded in our communities and our struggles they like there became a shift like and for my even myself included like it was like oh let's flip the script like um Filipino studies, what? What is that now? Um, and so it's it's really interesting to hear that. And man, the the '90s was hot. I mean, we Mark Polito was our was the first Filipino USAC president. Uh, the uprisings uh, in '92, the Chicano Chicana studies hunger strike, as as Bong was saying, and this was when our folks were just heavy going out into the community, caravanning to Agbayani village, visiting the the monos who worked in the fields, um, recognizing and remembering Manu Larry Itliong and all, and even having Manu Philip Veracruz keynoting at PGRAD. I didn't even know that. That is amazing. So the 90s was hot. And I think like that really speaks to that work of when we really try to carve spaces for our, our folks to be represented, but grounded in our struggle. Um, and then that creating a legacy of student organizing. Uh, and, but then also looking at how neoliberalism really shifts the times, right? So Joe was really talking about this where now as we're starting to see, there's there's now a shift, right? I think my brother was probably, my brother's year, which was like the late 90s, early 2000s was like one of the final classes of um, Filipinos uh, benefiting from affirmative action and getting into UCLA. And shortly after then, we started to see that shift that Joe was talking about where we're, st we're starting to see more Folks, young folks coming into UCLA getting admitted from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, which then did did make it very difficult to connect in the same ways as the students of the 90s with the struggles of our communities. Uh, and it was, and it, I also really appreciated Mike's reflections on how student organizing is not sexy. <laughs> like students have different perspectives. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of competing priorities, a, a lot of competing, not even competing, but just a lot of valid concerns that aren't always in concert with each other. Um, but again, it, um, it was really, really powerful to hear Mike illustrate the ways in which that um, when, when organizations are really unified and they, they link every, all of their resources, that's how you can, you can accomplish like in our year, three camp simultaneous campaigns, right? That's, that's powerful. And that, that really speaks to um, really struggling through that. And also Christine, it was really important to hear that perspective of how important it is to be represented in these institutions, not just as students, but also as um, staff and faculty, because sometimes when you're just present, you just know how to navigate more. You just know how to navigate these institutional spaces that students aren't privy to, right? And so it is so critical to be able to have that representation um, so that we can really push these these forward, right? And it was really beautiful to see the the images before, at the beginning of this, to see like this really is an intergenerational effort, both both with students and staff. So yeah, I, I, that was so some of the thoughts and reflections that I had from this first round. Um, and I wanna just add on, when I was at UCLA, Filipino studies helped me understand why I struggled with self-hate, my parents, even my extended family at times. I will never forget how reading Renato Constantino's Miseducation of the Filipino felt so empowering because for the first time, I could trace the colonial relationships between the Philippines with Spain and the United States and name with clarity a more nuanced analysis of my community's preoccupation with assimilating and acquiring status symbols. So when Filipino studies frameworks were coupled with my education studies background, I began to understand the various ways in which white supremacy, settler colonialism, chattel slavery, imperialism, and capitalism are intertwined and institutionalized in the United States legal, political, economic, social, and educational systems. In fact, I credit Filipino studies at UCLA with helping me develop a more critical understanding of my own Southeast Asian Filipino identity, which has deeply informed the ways I continue to show up as an ally working in solidarity in multi-ethnic spaces and with other communities who have been minoritized both in school and community organizing contexts. This experience is, was not only empowering, but healing. So my, the final round of questions to our panel here is, what does the institutionalization of the UCLA Filipino Studies minor in 2020 mean to you? How can Filipino studies help serve our communities and support our efforts to be allies in solidarity with Black lives and other communities, especially in this historical moment? So we'll go ahead and take it to Bong. I'll, uh, I'll focus on the how could Filipino studies serve communities, um, primarily because my friends and I, we had to grapple with that question so that we could explain what we were doing uh, to our loved ones. And the answer I remember giving <clears throat> was that Filipino studies links representation with problem solving. Um, to get your needs met, we, to get our needs met, we must exist first. And in the early 1990s, our community largely felt invisible, even in LA. So <clears throat> a lot was invested in being visible to the mainstream, not just on the streets, but also on the social and cultural scene and policy agenda. Um, but there was an effort to count our problems. Um, my friends and I were members of groups that made use of census data and pushed for the disaggregation of the Filipino American census count um, because the impulse was we must be able to say one million Filipino Americans live and work in LA County and six percent of them face absolute poverty that is concentrated in downtown LA. And that 25% of youth aged 14 to 18 years had major depression and have attempted suicide. 
we wanted hard data like that specific to our communities. Um, and Filipino studies gave us the, it conditioned an appreciation for specific data to our American experience. Um, Filipino studies serves the community because it has an important role to play in enabling us to do this kind of specific data-driven analytic work. To counter institutional racism, we must be able to document racist events and be able to analyze them <clears throat> so we could find short-term practical rule changes and push for long-term system to do the well. We need folks examining our American experience. Filipino studies serves the community because it delivers, also because it delivers visibility to our issues. And it provides a consistent, sympathetic attention to our specific American experience that begs us to not look away. Uh, Filipino studies reminds us that our American experience is bound up with the black and brown communities long and unrealized pursuit for equity and justice. I want to end by this reflection by acknowledging that in the current environment, we need to make good use of both representation and problem solving, not only as tools for relief, but also as forms of resistance. That PAA now seeks to link Filipino studies to a campaign on ending racism is what the long struggle for Filipino studies demands of us. And in this light, PAA is wise to want to engage in solidarity work, to want to engage us in um, social justice work along with other brown and black communities. Thank you. Thank you, Bong. I think you said it well. Um, working in higher ed, I understand the importance of the creation of a new minor. And in this case, having a minor is going to reel in a new level of visibility and accessibility. Um, whereas a concentration, and correct me if I'm wrong, a concentration required you to major in Asian American studies, a minor could be paired with another field of study. Um, the fact that the minor is an interdisciplinary uh, program promotes the idea that ethnic studies is not siloed and it bleeds into every fabric of life. Um, so therefore you can be a South campus major and still engage in Filipino studies. It matters now because there are still in many parts of our society where Filipinos are severely underrepresented. There are many assumptions made about our community. And as we have learned with recent events, we must be shining lights on our stories. Otherwise, the stories will be told for us. Um, and just to connect to the current events uh, with like the murder of George Floyd, which forced Americans to shine a mirror on, on today's society um, is important. But how many members of the black community have to die before we act? Um, Having education programs like the Filipino Studies Minor is a way to promote civically engaged minds. And now more than ever, our community must lose the sense of complacency, we must be involved in the dialogue about racism and stand in solidarity with our black community. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Bong. Um, so I was just thinking about like, what does it mean to me and I mean, while we definitely had many laughing, crying moments uh, in supporting the administrative behind the scenes effort, I feel like really indebted, especially listening to everyone, to the years long advocacy and struggle behind Filipino studies before me. And although I was not a UCLA alum, I broke down in tears when Lucy texted me or Professor Burns texted me that the Filipino studies minor was approved. I was just bawling. My, my parents were confused. Uh, what this journey highlighted to me was the importance of different people in the movement. Uh, in addition to students, I, I do want to affirm the importance of working in collaboration with faculty and staff. Uh, and that's really what um, Dr. Bautista or Emily uh, shared with us. 
Uh, and I even think, if I remember, like Noodle and I would have this conversation just about how this cannot be a student only advocacy effort either. Uh, and students cannot be in opposition to faculty and staff. Uh, instead, the minor proposal needed to have engagement with faculty and staff because it is the faculty and staff who have access and are privy to inner university workings. Faculty and staff can also have conversations with senior level administrators in a different way. So what I'm really trying to say is we cannot work separately from each other. And this is a recognition of decades of, of effort of students, faculty, staff, and community members. Uh, this is really about community and building allies. And this is how I see it as being a parallel to ways we can stand in solidarity with Black lives because we all have roles in this movement. Thank you everybody who shared for folks who are still on. Thank you. Uh, I remember receiving the news that the minor had passed on Instagram. Um, funny how information travels so quickly, but I, I read it and I was sitting in my room and I was like that, just like that, just like that. We're a part of this and UCLA has this and now it's a, a lot of universities, my own especially has been asking how they can bring that to where we're at. Um, what does this mean to me? Ethnic studies is powerful. Filipino studies is powerful. Um, in 2016, when CPS was being run, uh, there was also a potential for defunding the ethnic studies department at SFSU. Um, SFSU is the home of ethnic studies and it was actually gonna be their 50th, it was their 50th year, yeah, in 2019. So, how can this relate to the current times? The ethnic studies strike at SFSU, black organizers, students and faculty were advocating for one, increased access for black students to the university and to a black studies department. That was the longest student initiated student ran strike in the United States history. Um, and it's the home of ethnic studies. And so when I think about what's happening right now, right? I see so many parallels. Filipino studies and education itself for our community, it is a tool and a key for liberation. Um, I personally have never felt more powerful knowing about myself, my family, and my community, understanding our history, and then imagining futures and where we can be. Um, what we're seeing right now is this mass education of, of a lot of people who are having to confront things like anti-racism, anti-blackness, and white supremacy, including within our own community. And so the institutionalization of Filipino studies at UCLA is just the start, I'm hoping, of many, right? Where is our place in a predominantly white institution? Where is our story being told? And now that this is formally in, in the setting of our academia, not only run by student classes, but now offered as a minor, you know, this is a step in the right direction. You gotta bring it back to the no history, no self. Um, I am so much stronger because I know, and I've unlocked so much within myself and my area because I've been able to learn through Filipino studies. And so imagine a world where students can engage with their history and feel that same kind of empowerment and go off to do what they were meant to do instead of following the beaten path. Um, I really see Filipino studies as that bridge for us to start reaching over into other communities and understanding where we connect, as well as pushing us forward. So go Filipino studies, go UCLA. I am so happy to be here. This has been such an awesome experience and um, this is only the beginning of the next chapter. Thank you all panelists. Um, just some closing thoughts to bring your thoughts today in, in a final conversation. Um, I think a lot of what you all are speaking to in this round of the panel really, really just speaks to the, the impact of imperialism and colonialism on our communities, right? 1905, St. Louis World Fair, our people are being brought as literally museum exhi exhibits for people to gawk at and take pictures and having that, that, um, that gaze, that colonial gaze over our people. And then 
continuing when we're, we're fighting for liber our li independence from Spain. And when the United States comes in for its, its own reasons um, to support, um, even, even so, uh, we have black soldiers who are starting to recognize, hold on, how, is, how are we still seeing the same kind of racism towards the Filipinos that like using the same kind of anti-blackness towards Filipinos with, with the soldiers, right? And so seeing these beautiful moments of black soldiers actually flipping sides. And when we're, so now when we're actually, let me, let, let me actually go back. This was the time when actually the, the, the Philippines was trying to get its liberation from the United States. Um, colonization, that's when actually black soldiers were in solidarity with our liberation um, from colonialism. And I've only learned these things because of Filipino studies. Filipino studies was pow is powerful because it helps us not only know who we are, but who stood up for us and who stood with us in these moments of, of struggle um, and triumph. And so ethnic studies, is really founded on this, this, it's really not just about like teaching our history, right? It's deeper than that. We're seeing, we're seeing in K-12 that we're, we're seeing this movement of trying to get ethnic studies institutionalized, but now we see this, this, these challenges of like, but will it really honor the spirit, right? I was really blessed to still be able to take ethnic studies classes that were grounded in community action, right? It wasn't just about knowing our history just to have the knowledge. It was to be grounded in this long history of struggle and to as Bone was saying, to, help, to be grounded in who we are, to be able to document, to be able to, to make visible our struggles, right? And when we do that, then people can show up for us, right? And so I think that's what Filipino studies means to, to me, is, is teaching us who we are and the potential of who we can be and what the power of, of that can be when we are doing that in solidarity and in collaboration with other communities. and. I thank everyone for being here and for all the, the panelists for sharing these reflections, especially for this, this incredible moment that we are in that has, I don't know if anything will ever um, compete with us in our lifetimes, multiple pandemics, uh, multiple Christ happening simultaneously, literally in this moment. So I thank you all for gathering here to reflect, to not only celebrate, to also call our community into action. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, uh, for, moder for moderating that. Thank you all to all the panelists for, for providing your time and, and experience and, and lessons learned, right? You know, this is a, a great uh, opportunity to just learn from these lessons, to pass it on and to utilize those lessons. Um, but now it's our, I know it's a little late, um, but we really do want to hear from you all um, and to get your thoughts on on these, uh, on on this passage of the Filipino studies minor, as well as the current situation that we're in right now. So I'm gonna uh, paste 